Kerete. All right, now that I have internet, we should be able to watch this. I've been wanting to uh, show this. It's just a few minutes, and I think it is at least something somewhat motivational when you think about how far some people have gone in Greek and what it has helped with. So there, this is uh, going to be talking about a poem by a Greek grammarian, New Testament scholar who was uh, of yesteryear. Uh, he, he's got a famous grammar and lexicon. Um, the lexicon is called Moulton and Milligan, MM, if you've ever seen that abbrevi abbreviation in commentaries. But um, this is an interesting little clip, and I'm kind of skipping ahead. The poem we're going to talk about today is one that I, I can read to you, and it's found at the beginning of the beginning Greek grammar that my co-author, Ben Merkel, and I wrote. Again, the title of our book is Beginning with New Testament Greek. And in the beginning of that, I don't know if you, I hope you didn't just skim over this. There's a poem by J.H. Moulton. Okay, Moulton is a famous, was a famous British Greek grammarian. Um, you may be familiar with the multi-volume work known as MHT, Moulton Howard Turner, this multi-volume British ref reference grammar, and he is one of the authors of it, J.H. Moulton. And where did I find this poem? It's an amazing poem. And um, I found this poem here. Isn't this beautiful? When you go to an old book sale and you find a treasure like this, this is when uh, Moulton's volume uh, was coming out, volume two, two of the MHT grammar was coming out in fascicles. So this is one of the fascicles. Actually, I guess I have two of the fascicles uh, as they came out. I, I don't remember where I bought this, some used book sale. And in, in this, it, the, this poem didn't make it into the, the final copy, I don't believe. But in this, this is where I found this beautiful poem. Now, before I read it, I want to tell a little bit more about Moulton. Um, uh, and here is his full name, not just J.H., but James Hope Moulton. And you, you can see the poem is dated to February 21st, 1917, written in Bangalore. It's a lot of information right there, right? Because it's written in the midst of World War I, and Moulton is in Bangalore, India, having gone there uh, to do missionary work. And, and he was, would soon, after this poem was written, return to Great Britain. So here's someone who's not just a grammarian who loves and knows the Greek New Testament, but who is propelled in mission, propelled outward with the gospel um, by his study, which is a beautiful thing for us. He, uh, tragic story, on his way back to Great Britain from India, the boat that he was on, remember this is in the midst of World War I, was torpedoed by a, by a German submarine. Um, the boat sank. He and some other people were uh, on a life raft. He was floating in the open sea on a life raft, and he died on the third day and was buried at sea. On the fourth day, they reached land. They were able to reach Corsica, if I remember correctly. So just a story of sacrifice and mission and, and tragedy. It's just all kinds of stuff in the life of this famous Greek grammarian. Listen to this poem, though. It's called At the Classroom Door. And this is a poem every uh, teacher of the Bible, I think, could, could recite. Lord, at thy word opens yon door, inviting teacher and taught to feast this hour with thee. Opens a book where God and human writing thinks his deep thoughts and dead tongues live for me. To dread the task, too great the duty calling, too heavy far the weight is laid on me. Oh, if mine own thought should on thy words falling mar the great message and men hear not thee. Give me thy voice to speak, thine ear to listen. Give me thy mind to grasp thy mystery. So shall my heart throb and my glad eyes glisten, wrapped with the wonders thou dost show to me. Well, amen. Let that be our prayer. Those of us who are teachers, may the Lord make us faithful and may not just our, our minds be ignited, but may our hearts and our souls be ignited, ignited with passion for him and his word. I, I don't know what Moulton's denominational affiliation was, but 
I, I just thought that was kind of a beautiful idea that even these dead tongues come alive whenever you realize that God was speaking through them. And so um, that's a, I, I wanted to show that in the first class, but things just didn't work out technology-wise. All right, so let's do the alphabet song together. Ready? We'll go slow. Alpha, Vita, Gamma, Delta, Epsilon, Zeta, Eta, Theta, Kappa, Lambda, Mi, Mi, Xi, Omicron, Pi, Rho, Sigma, Tav, Epsilon, Phi, Ki, Psi, Omega. All right. Uh, if you didn't learn that, we've got it recorded last class, this class. Just keep on working on it. I think having a song makes it a little easier to memorize. And then if you have the way they sound, you've got most of the pronunciation pretty well because alpha, a, vita, vi, so on and so forth. So learn how to say the letters correctly at the start, sing them correctly, and then you'll have the sounds uh, accurate. All right, so a couple of odds and ends that I didn't get to in the last class. Um, I did note as we were going through that these are our vowels. We have alpha, which can be a short or long A. Um, we pronounce it the same way, but just for spelling purposes later on, um, it may not even be super important to you all. Just know that that one can function as a long or a short. The epsilon is a short E. The iota could be either short or long. Omicron, remember that's small, small O, so that is the short uh, eta is the long E. Epsilon is your, in essence, a U, though we, it sounds like an E in Greek, in modern Greek. And omega is your big O, so it is your long O. So in a similar way, just like we kind of have long and short, uh, they also have long and short. But uh, we're not going to, that's one of those things that I'm throwing at you and then you can throw away for now because it's not going to be super important. Just want you to be aware. Those are vowels. A, E. In essence, in English, it would be A, E, I, O and then another E, and then U, and then an O. So they, they have the same vowels that we do in essence. They just separate some of them into long and short. All right, uh, diphthongs. That's not a word we usually use, but that just may, means that you're kind of putting two sounds to get, uh, together to make one sound. Um, my son Noah is, um, he, he was diagnosed with dyslexia some time ago, and so he's doing some additional tutoring, and it's interesting that uh, his teacher is teaching this concept of diphthongs, even though I don't remember ever learning diphthongs in my English classes, that that's what they were called. But it's interesting that for those who have some difficulty processing those things, they do kind of go into the, uh, to the uh, theory behind it. So diphthongs, it just means we're putting two vowels together, but they're only making one sound. So for instance, um, this one, alpha iota, and you may want to write this down as we go through, is A, A. So in, in a sense, it sounds kind of like your epsilon, the E up there, uh, epsilon, A. Uh, not I as in aisle, but A, um, as in air, maybe, kind of like air, A-I-R. Uh, so if you can make that connection in English, that we make that similar sound. All right, epsilon yota, makes the sound E. <laughs> what you're going to find is that we have E, E, E in the vowels. We're going to have more E's <laughs> in the diphthongs as well. They like that sound. So epsilon iota is E, as in the American pronunciation of the word either. In British, it's either. <laughs> Actually, it's either. <laughs> but in, in uh, American uh, English, uh, it's Supposedly, supposed to be pronounced either. So we have that E sound with the E-I. Uh, so either. And then the next one, Omicron Iota, is E. <laughs> e. All right. Now, uh, and then final one that's not as common is Ypsilon Iota. And that one is also E. <laughs> as in the word distinguish, uh, you almost get that kind of E sound with a U-I in English. Uh, slightly different, but it's a kind of an E. e. Um, what I would note on all these that end in Yota is that they all sound like E except for AI. They all sound like E except for AI. 
Um, and notice that we're only going to, with diphthongs, they're only going to ever end in iota or ypsilon. Um, now going to the ypsilons endings, omicron ypsilon, the OU, is going to sound like U, U. Um, as in the English word youth, notice how we make one sound with the OU, youth, U. So this is U, as in youth, U. Then we get some tricky ones that's going to be one of those things I throw at you, and then you can throw away if you want. Um, with all these other ones that end in Y, the U, they're not actually not going to sound like you would expect them to sound. Um, the AU, alpha, Y, is going to sound like either av or af. Av or af. You notice that whenever I said the letter tav, that would actually be spelled T-A-U, and they would pronounce it tav. Um, I, I'll, it, it's kind of like the word, even though we have a V to help it out, mauve, <laughs> the color mauve. Um, that's kind of how it sounds. There are some circumstances, depending on what letter comes after it, that it's either going to be more of an F sound, af, or more of a V sound, av. Uh, again, Throw it at you, and you can throw it away. Uh, the epsilon, epsilon is um, either ev or f, ev or f. And this one, you can put an English word with it, and it will make sense. Here's the Greek. Evangelion. That's the word for gospel. When we say the word evangelism, we don't say you angelizo. Uh, we say evangelism. Why is that? Because that you get that ev. So even in English, we kind of see some of the similarity there, or the similarity of what sound they make there. And then the last one would be eve. Um, so with the I diphthongs, the iota diphthongs, it, except for AI, if the dip, diphthong ends in an iota, it will sound like E. If, except for OU or Omicron Y, if the diphthong ends in Y or U, it will sound like an F or a V. So either AV, F, E, <laughs> um, and so on and so forth. But again, I'm not going to be too worried about the pronunciation. That's just how they do it in modern. Probably did something similar in ancient Greek as well. But I did, the main thing I want you to get before we get started uh, going forward is that those combinations are considered as if they are one vowel because they only make one vowel sound. All right, so it's not ai, it is a. <laughs> uh, so just kind of get that in your mind. Just like we make one sound with diphthongs, they make one sound with diphthongs. Consonant clusters, again, don't have to be too worried about it, but when you get a gamma gamma put together, it makes an NG sound, just like the word evangelion. Uh, this is also the word for angel. We don't say agagel. We say angel because they would uh, give it a N sound on the first gamma. Um, I think this is called something like nasalization of the gamma. Uh, you make it a mmm because you're using your nose. Mm, g, mm. And um, that, that's the case with all these other cl clusters. Don't worry about it, but it's ng, ng, or ng, 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 And then you have some different things that happen here. It's in your handouts. Um, this would actually be, instead of a um, it would be a umb with a B sound with the P. This, instead of a unt. It would be und with a D sound. Again, don't worry about it. I just want you to be aware that that is what has happened. So when you hear me pronounce a word and you're like, why in the world did he pronounce it like that? This is the part where I'll try to say it correctly and you just kind of pick it up as we go. But it's like evangelion. Uh, you'll, you'll eventually kind of pick that up as we go along. All right, the next is Yoda subscript. Notice we have a diphthong there. If this was a long O, you don't add the iota right after it. Because the iota is a weak letter, 
And so what you may see in some words is that it doesn't like to stay there, it will drop underneath. And uh, that's called an iota subscript because it goes underneath a long vowel. It can do that with an long alpha. Uh, it can do that with a eta because it's long. Uh, again, throwing it out there, you can throw it away. As far as pronunciation goes, you just make the sound of the long vowel. You don't, this has no pronunciation value. It's just might change the meaning of the word, just so you're aware. So it's instead of a, this would be a, e, o. So whenever you pronounce it, don't worry about a sound for iota. Just be aware that if you see it, there isn't a iota in the word. It's just kind of fake, secondary, <laughs> underneath. All right, and then breathing marks, we've talked a little bit at the beginning of a word. Um, you will see a little apostrophe. It's either going to be this way or this way. Um, this is called a soft breathing mark. This is a um, hard breathing. And um, in modern Greek, they have no pronunciation value. Just need you to be aware that they're there because... You have this word, and the only difference between them is the breathing mark. You're not going to have to memorize this. <laughs> this means the feminine. This means or. So it, it can make a difference in the meaning of a word. Just be aware of that. But what I'm going to be teaching you after we get through all of this stuff is how to use your tool so that you won't ever be confused. Now, if you want to go deeper, we can always go farther after this class, and you can try to get all those intricacies and be able to open up your New Testament and read it for yourself. But I uh, just want you to be aware that it is there. Accents, we talked about those. For our purposes, you're just going to put emphasis on the syllable that that accent is on. Today, we're going to be talking about how you know what a syllable is in Greek. And then... Uh, Diaresis, diaresis, um, just being aware that it is there. It looks like a German, what is that called? Umlaut. Umlaut. Um, and what? Umlaut. <laughs> Thank you. You'll be, my, uh, <laughs> you'll be my resident German speaker whenever I have a German thing that needs to be said. Um, what that means is that instead of it becoming a diphthong, they're letting you know that this is not a diphthong, and this is making its own sound. So it's ai instead of av. Don't worry, I'm just throwing it at you, and then you can bat it away. Uh, but I just want you to be aware that it is there. All right, yes? Quick question on the iota subscript. Uh, if you were trying to say, like, have you met the definition of breathing with the iota? I'm not sure. I don't think you would. But I'll have to look at that. I, I, I can't remember. I, would that not be more to your next step? Well, as far as transliterating into English, I'm not sure if the I comes in after that or not. I, I can't remember what happens there. All right. Any other questions, comments? Yes. Ah. So it'd be ah. You're just sounding them out like the vowels themselves. So you're pretending that for pronunciation, so, so like it doesn't exist whenever you pronounce it. So it's just whatever it sounds like in your regular alpha, a, eta, e, omega, o. Um, that's the sound that you would make. Right. Right. Yeah. The, for for the for the. For this purpose, if you see an iota subscript, it's only for reading purposes, not for pronunciation purposes. So if you were reading a text, you would recognize it. For our purposes, it won't be especially important. Just it, We're aware that it exists. <laughs> All right, syllabification. Greek words form syllables in basically the same way as English words do. We don't even think about syllables whenever we pronounce our words anymore. So I would suggest that go with your gut, because it's probably going to be right. If that's how you would pronounce it in English, it's pretty close to what you're going to do in Greek. But there are two rules that are helpful, and you can see them on the screen. 
but I'm going to illustrate them up here. So the first rule is there is one vowel or diphthong per syllable. So which ones are our vowels? Epsilon? Omicron. Those are our two vowels in this word. Now that's why learning the alphabet is somewhat important so that you can know what your consonants are and what your vowels are. That means if you have two vowels, how many syllables should you have? Two. So that's all that's saying, is that you're only going to have the number of syllables for the number of vowel sounds that you have, either by actual vowel or by diphthong, which makes one vowel sound. Rule number two, a single consonant go, most of the time will go with the following vowel. So whenever we say this, and um, there are some, let's use the one on the screen here. We have one vowel sound here, because it's a diphthong, off, off. And then we have tav, omicron, sigma, tos. Now you could say oft os, but what this rule is basically saying is if you have a single vowel with, at the, particularly at the beginning, with this vowel sound, shove it to the next part. So <coughs> af tos, af tos. This one, here's where you have a slight, this is not a single vowel, so you're not going to shove it forward. It's or it's single consonant, you have two consonants, so you're going to put this consonant with the first vowel and the next consonant with the next vowel. One way I like to think of it is that if possible, you're going to try to have a vowel and a consonant or a consonant vowel consonant. That's usually how syllables are going to work. So this would be ergon, ergon. This would be ev. An, gel. Now, we have no consonants, but we have two vowels right together. But you're going to try to, you have to keep one vowel per syllable, right? So it's e, on, evangelion. Now, you can put that all together. At first, you're going to have to go through slowly to kind of just think through, what am I doing here? But if someone said, I want you to make sure I spell right. <laughs> Syllabify the word syllable. Would you just immediately say, oh, it's this, this, this. You'd say, wait a second. <laughs> Let me think of this. Syl, oh, actually, you probably put it there. Syl, a, bull. <laughs> Syl, a, bull. And so we, we'd have to think about it in English as well. So if you're having to think through it in Greek, that's okay. We'd have to think through it in English as well. But as you work through, I'll try to pronounce things the way I, I believe they ought to be pronounced. And then you can kind of just pick up as you go. But these are some of these rules for uh, syllabification. So let's do this with John 3.16. John 3.16. Now, you just learned diphthong, so some of these will be unfamiliar. But this is John 3.16 in Greek at the top. What I've done down here is I have divided it into syllables for you. And the reason I'm doing this is just to kind of illustrate what, how you would pronounce these words. So if you come to this, the very first thing you're going to be doing, uh, in fact, let me see if I can bring up my laser pointer. There we go. Um, so you have utos. Notice this is one of our diphthongs because it's a omicron, ypsilon. And we have a single consonant after it. We're going to shove that to this part, and then we have a single consonant here. So vowel, I guess I should put that as another option. Vowel, vowel consonant, or vowel, or consonant, vowel, consonant. Um, so you have one here, and what I would probably do if I had a text in front of me, if I was trying to figure out how to syllabify, first I'd underline my vowels or my vowel sounds. Then I would try to figure out how can I have a single vowel sound here. So here I'd have oo tos. Oo tos. 
Now look at this. We have gamma, alpha, rho. Does that match any of these? How many vowels do we have? How many sounds should we have? How many syllables? One. So in this case, we're going to have that consonant, vowel, consonant, gar. So it's just one sound. So some words are only going to have one sound because they're either just a vowel or they're a uh, vowel and consonant, vowel and consonant, uh, or consonant, vowel, consonant. So utos gar. Now here's where it gets fun. And, and we're just going to look at this quickly. You have a vowel and then a consonant and then a vowel and then a consonant. How many sounds should we have just with this first part? Two, because we have two vowels. But we have single consonants after them. So you would say e gap. So see how you're pushing that one to the uh, second, the gamma there to the next part? So e gap. And then we have e. And then we have consonant, vowel, consonant. So we're saying pushing that sigma to the next, sen. Igapisen. Um, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this in class. I would suggest if you have an opportunity, and I'm going to show you some resources, just try to get a Greek text out and see if you can kind of read through it, even if you don't know what it means, so that you could eventually get to where you just kind of get the feel of it. So you go, utos garigapisen, o theos ton kosmon. You know, you can start to kind of run through once you get the handle on it. Um, so just remember for now, don't get overwhelmed with this, but one vowel, um, one vowel or vowel sound is going to be one syllable, and then you just have to figure out how the consonants fit with it. All right, punctuation. That is a comma in English and Greek. It's a comma, all right? Um, now, I would just point out that this is only true of copies of the New Testament later on because the original copies would have been all caps, no gaps, no punctuation for the most part. And so this is kind of a later phenomenon for the Greek New Testaments that we can hold in our hands. Uh, but a comma is a comma, a period is a period, but this little dot in the middle of the line, that's a semicolon. I don't know why, they just left off the comma underneath, didn't they? So that is a semicolon. <coughs> which shows that there is probably some correspondence between the first part and the second part. And then the semicolon, or the uh, what looks like a semicolon, is a question mark. So that's their question mark in, uh, in Greek. So if you see a, that right there, you know that it's not a statement. It is a question. All right. Just be aware that that's there. All right. So what I would like us to do is kind of work through an activity. If you'll take one and pass it back, we have a Greek song. Actually, I may need a copy. I didn't put it on the screen, I don't think. Thank you. All right, we spell out this Greek word in English, and this is a title in, I think, Psalms, Hymns, and Spiritual Songs. Doxology. Anybody ever heard that word before? What does the word doxology mean? Mm -hmm. So you've got the first part is glory. Loia. Hmm? Uh, good guess. Let me give a word that's similar. And I'll do it in Greek and English. Does anyone know what that word means? Word. Word. Logos. Um, so loia, this is basically a word of glory or a word of praise, a, a statement of praise. And so you hear this word and sometimes even see it in the headings of some of your Bibles that at the end of a letter or something, it'll say a doxology. That's a word of praise at the end of a letter. Well, there is a song that in some hymnals is called doxology. Um, let me go back one. And sometimes it's called... Um, um, what is it called? Uh, I can't remember what the what it is called in English. But um, can anyone kind of look at the melody and see if it sounds familiar? That's what it's called. Praise God. <laughs> All blessings flow uh, in some of the uh, hymnals. Um, 
this has been, if you'll notice here that J.R. Packer and Bill Mounts have put to that music a Greek translation of the English song. And um, what it basically says here, if you look on your handout, is ton theon. Now notice hymns are kind of helpful because sometimes they'll put the dash in for you where the syllable is. So ton theon. Now the next word is o. If you see an omega, how many syllables do you think that ought to be? One, because you got one vowel and that's the whole word. <laughs> um, so uh, o. Then we have it syllabified for us again. Notice the the dashes. Do zax zi ze te. And then it's syllabified for us again. Ev do ki san ta. I'll translate this in just a second. Do re an. Do re an. Ta. Now here's a fun word. Notice you have kappa, tav, iota, sigma. Now you've got four letters there. How many vowels do you have? One vowel. So how many sounds or how many syllables? One syllable. So you've got to fit <laughs> into one syllable. <laughs> Uh, katis, and then mat, and then a, ah, then pe. Now notice that next one. It has two vowels, but what is unique about these two vowels? It's a diphthong. So you have the oi is one of our diphthongs, where it ends in an i or ends in a u. So this is pe pi, and then you have e, then ken. So notice in this word you have consonant vowel, consonant diphthong, vowel, consonant vowel, consonant. So it fits all of these scenarios that we put up. I may have forgot to put consonant vowel, or no, no, I put vowel consonant. Uh, but you could have consonant vowel at the beginning. So again, one vowel equals one syllable. Um, and then pa, te, ra. Patera. Have any idea what that means? Father. father. All right. E on. What might you guess is after father? Son. Ion. And then K is the word for and. Notice we have two vowels, but AI is what? It's a diphthong. Very good. So consonant, diphthong, K. Then we have four letters with this next one before the dash. A P, Ni, Epsilon, Ypsilon. How many vowel sounds do we have here? One, because we have the E-U. That's one vowel sound, so you've got to fit that in. Pnef, Pnef uh, is actually how it would be in modern. Pnef, Ma, and then you have Amin. What does that mean? It means Amen, and so be it. Uh, again, that's a Hebrew loan word that has come into Greek, but it's Amin. So put it all together, it would be Ton theon o do doxa zete, sorry, doxa zete, evdoki santa, actually in modern Greek it'd be evdoki sanda, dorean ta ktismata pepi iken patera ion kepnefma amin. So let's go through kind of quickly. It, Yes. So sorry. Um, at the end of um, uh, why the breath mark? Where are you pointing at? Um, actually, it probably shouldn't be over the top. Um, it should be just beside it, uh, to the right, because they are telling you that the <laughs> the actual word is. Uh, Katismata. The word is katismata. But you have, and we'll learn this later on, or we may just allude to it. If you have a vowel that follows, what they do in Greek is drop it off, show that you have a conjunction, if you will, or, and uh, just let it flow into the next word. So that that's a little bit further down the road, but that... That's what's happening there. All right, so uh, 
All right, so let's see if we can sing very slowly this song together. W one more time, let me read through. If you need some help with the sounds, write them underneath in English. So, tone, tone, se, on. So, tone, se, on. Do. Uh, let's put it as an X. Folks. Uh, JK, sorry to put that so close. Ev, or actually, F. Do, Ti, San. Da. Ta. Do. Re. An. Right. Ta. Tis. Ma. A. Pe. Ti. I'm just giving you sounds, not actually direct transliterations. Ken Patera Ion K Not in K Neth Ma uh, all right, and just writing that out will help your brain as well. These first two weeks, we're learning pronunciation, but we're event probably next week going to get to a point where we're not even worry worrying as much about pronunciation. So if you're feeling a little, what, are, what about all this stuff? Don't worry, we're moving beyond it. We just have to get past this foundation. So let's try to sing it before our bell rings. So. Where is probably somewhere around a G? Hmm, close enough. On te on ho do sa se te e do ki san da do re han ta kis ma ta. So you know the tune, you can work through the sounds, that'll help you, singing helps. Um, there will be no class on Wednesday, because I'll be at PFT, so just go into the adult class and then we'll meet back on Sunday. What I would suggest you work on this week, just try to memorize the alphabet and those diphthong sounds. That's all I really want you to get out of this, these first uh, several classes. Get there and then we can move forward. So appreciate everyone's participation.